Energy media readers, we're going to talk about a little different subject today, and that is the wolf call that is being undertaken by the provinces of BC and Alberta in order to support caribou, uh, caribou uh, population recovery. And it's how they do it and who's funding it is part of the problem. So uh, to talk to us about this, I'd uh, like to welcome Lisa Dahlside to the interview. Thank you. So Lisa, you're a conservationist now, and you've been involved in the, uh, an organization that is lobbying and, and trying to educate uh, British Columbians and Albertans about this issue. Could you give me just a, a brief overview of what the problem is? Well, um, fundamentally, we know that wolves play a very critical role in uh, ecological stability, um, contributing to biodiversity. Their presence in the environment is critical. And the problem is, is that we are um, intentionally trying to extirpate them from the ecosystem, which will have cascading effects on the environment. And so we want to draw awareness towards this so that it, it can stop. So my understanding is that they're, they're being uh, culled in a couple of different ways. One of them is with poison uh, in Alberta, which is outlawed in BC. But the other, and it, it, it's a little bit disturbing, I have to admit, is this idea of, of shooting wolves from helicopters, uh, which seems a little, a little extreme. And why are, are governments funding these kinds of cull programs? Um, well, I, th I think that the reason why it is being funded is simply because they do have a legal obligation to respond to the caribou decline in population, and this seems to be the chosen one. I don't know why that was the chosen method, um, but it, it, ha it seems to be the one. Uh, it's very expensive, so again, I'm not sure why aerial killing and strychnine poisoning would be the choice. Okay. Now, uh, I think everybody who's watching this can probably agree that uh, having the caribou population recover, and it's, under, of course, under pressure from oil and gas in Alberta, uh, is there a better way to do this so that the caribou's population can recover at the same time without, you know, shooting a bunch and poisoning a, a bunch of wolves? I and mean, what, are, what are the alternatives? Well, the caribou population in both Alberta and BC is uh, quite fragmented, very much um, in decline from past uh, population estimates. So there, we, we're always pointing towards habitat protection. That's the you know, basic elementary, every grade one student in, in the country knows that caribou would need habitat to recover. But of course, that does infringe on some of the industry um, um, applications or whatnot. So, there is options though, we could just protect certain habitats and allow exploitation of other habitats that aren't critical caribou habitat. So we could also move around working with, um, with, their, with their movements, um, uh, even working with, with recreation in an effective way. Perhaps it's um, you know, getting snowmobiles to, to draw wolves away from where the critical caribou habitat is, allowing them to still utilize the landscape, allowing industry to continue uh, use of the landscape, but just in a more responsible and um, reflective way to ensure that they're not increasing access of wolves to caribou habitat. Um, so if I understand this correctly, uh, your problem is not, of course, I'm sure you'd be in, a, in an in agreement with the idea of, of supporting caribou population recovery. And of course, we all have to, uh, there has, you know, industrial activity is going to continue in these areas. But we'd, you, you'd like, if I understand this correctly, you'd like to see a strategy put in place because there, that would accommodate all three, wolves, caribou, and industrial development. And you think that that's uh, possible? I, I do. I believe strongly it's entirely possible. There's been a lot of research already put into this. Dr. Uh, Gilbert Pro has put um, considerable um, research into what alternatives uh, could be um, made. And he's even worked with uh, forestry industry who, who would agree with, with a lot of his decisions. However, they still have to meet their annual allowable cut, which doesn't... Um, allow for not cutting and clear cutting all of these different habitats. But if we can modify some of these regulations and we can modify the way that we're doing things, we can definitely address caribou recovery in a non-lethal management way. Is there any way, what other non-lethal options are there? I mean, like trapping 
trapping, live trapping, and then relocating? Is that an option? What, what kind of options have we got? That could be an option to um, consider. I haven't really put much thought into that, but definitely in the United States, there's several states that are um, reintroducing wolves as well as um, uh, just discussing the reintroduction possibilities because they have had extirpation of wolves on a local scale and it's impacted their ecosystem greatly. So they want the wolves back. So that could be potentially something. Um, I think too, just uh, we are disrupting their population we're disrupting the pack structure of wolves so significantly that we're potentially actually increasing predation as a result um, by remove uh, and also potentially in small areas temporarily increasing the population of wolves because we're removing the one breeding pair, the alpha pair, and now you uh, you remove them and you open it up to all the other individuals in the pack to now be breeding uh, individuals and without the direction of that hierarchy structure, they, they're maybe taking more cattle, for example, or whatnot, things like that are being disrupted. So by leaving wolves alone, not killing them, we actually encourage a stable population as a result, as well as very significantly defined territories um, that they can work within, we can identify where these territories are and work around that uh, to ensure that they're not getting to the caribou. Um, another potential idea uh, would be caribou shepherding. So it's being used, uh, it's used in nine countries around the world. Thousands of reindeer herders even exist today. So uh, this has been going on for thousands of years as well. So we don't have, it's not something new. We have um, the expertise available to us and we could potentially employ indigenous um, uh, caribou shepherds to just be with these caribou herds, which would which would definitely um, decrease predation on those caribou. And it would also open up opportunity for research. So by having somebody constantly with these herds, we can be researching not only the caribou themselves, but also the forest habitats um, and working um, to gain more research. Uh, the la final question, Lisa, uh, my, I, I don't know this issue well, uh, so I'm kind of getting up to speed here, but my take on this so far is that there are options, but you know, kind of inertia governs a lot of what gov what governments do and industry does, and nobody really wants to you know step outside the box and and think innovatively and maybe spend a little extra money than they have in the past. Is that kind of what we've got going on here? Um, possibly. Possibly, for sure. And I think a lot of it is just this is Alberta's been doing the wolf call program since 2004-2005 uh, that winter. So this has been going on for a long time. And they're like, this is the way we do things. And so potentially stepping out of that box is an issue for uh, the government decision makers. However, um, I, I think that it's about time that they do because we, we don't have any public support on this initiative. It's also not effective. We now have 15 years of data to prove without doubt that the caribou population has not recovered in response to killing over 2,500 wolves in the province of Alberta. And in BC, we've killed just over 700 wolves. And again, the population's not improving as a result. So we do need to step outside the box and we do need to explore other options because this is a critical time. We need those populations to recover for many different reasons. Well, that's very interesting, uh, and maybe we can explore that in a, in a different interview. Uh, but thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it, and I know we'll be coming back to talk to you again in the near future. Thank you.